Welcome to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their successes, but shining a spotlight on the journey that it took for them to get there. Now, this week's guest, I brought on because I get so many requests, basically because of my background in the music industry. People always ask me, Sean, how can I get a record deal? If I'm a producer, how can I get my beats placed? I wanted to bring an expert in this area so that we can have a deep dive conversation and I can extract all of the information for anybody who is looking to get a beat place, become a producer, and make their mark in the music industry. So this week's guest, please welcome to the Power Move Maker Series, Miss Sarah Johnson. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. It's a lot I want to go over today. You have worked with artists and producers. You had a very long standing career in the music industry. Can you please just give us a little background on yourself and your history? Yes, um, I've been in the game for about 14, 15 years. Um, I started out um, on MySpace, was like my number one networking tool. I used to work out of some different um, studios in DC, um, in the DC, Virginia area a long time ago. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, and I just started networking heavy on MySpace. I started to, you know, just kind of reach out to people. I, I love networking. Um, and so I would just, do a lot of networking online and things like that. I used to um, send beat CDs to the labels once I started to kind of grab um, different producers from MySpace and different areas of studios and things. Um, I used to shop beats to the labels, send CDs out every single day. I would FedEx stuff. I didn't care how much it costs. Like, I just felt like this is an investment. They're going to get my stuff tomorrow. I'd call up there. Hey, this is Sarah. Did you get my beat CD? Oh, no, it's in the mail room. I'll call you back. So I kind of got the runaround a lot, you know what I mean? And so that's when it just sparked in my head. I was like, I got to go see these people. So I would take flights back and forth to New York and L.A. sitting down with, you know, Riggs and Conrad and Lenny S. and all the vets, you know, in the A&R game, just building the relationships. And once I started to do that, like everything really just picked up. I started to get a lot of mixtape placements, you know, with um, Jim Jones, Lloyd Banks and 50 and, you know, all the old New York rappers. And then it just started to pick up, you know, um, mixtape work turned into album work. And I felt like my name was kind of buzzing um, about like, where are you getting these beats from? People started reaching out to me. I didn't have to chase so much. So that felt good. So whenever I'm talking to producers now in the game, I always tell them, like, try to build a relationship um, with the artist and their manager as soon as possible. Um, just because, you know, you're getting directly to the source. It's not so much middleman shit and stuff like that. But um, you got to network, you got to network, you got to, you got to get out here, you got to travel. Um, it's just really crucial if you really want to just kind of, um, just stand out from all the other producers that are doing the same thing, the same thing, spamming online. Um, you know, Hey, Wale, did you get my beats? Did you click my link? Like you got to find other ways to just stand out. Understood. Would it be safe to say that you are an expert in the area of shopping beats, placing beats, and working with producers? Yes, I would say so, yeah, for okay. sure. So we're talking to the right person. I just wanted to establish the credibility because you, obviously I know who you are. There are many people who are gonna watch this and they're going to, to be glued to either the, the YouTube version or the audio version on podcast form because you're gonna be able to provide information that they are so desperately seeking. Yes. I want to make this segment specific to upstart producers who have no placements whatsoever and mid-tier producers who are not necessarily household name, but they might have a placement or two, might have been featured on an album or a few mixtapes, but their name is not out there yet. It's still in the, it's still in the area of their career where they're struggling. Nobody's calling them. They're still needing to shop, network, and do all the things to get their beats placed. Mm -hmm. 
Uh-huh. I am a, a, a brand new producer, no placement whatsoever. What is my rate? How am I establishing getting my music? Say, let's say I do get my music out there, and we'll get to that part. But what am I charging? Well, you want to keep your prices pretty low if you have nothing out because um, you have no value to yourself. You want to build your discography. You want to build the value to yourself in your catalog. So when I say keep your prices low, um, anywhere from $50 to 100 bucks for non-exclusive, if it's exclusive, three, dollars $400 range, always ask people their budget. You know what I mean? You might be dealing with somebody from overseas that has a lot of money to spend on beats or whatever, and maybe you shoot yourself in the foot or whatever with your price. So I always ask their budget. I do that all the time. I tell producers to do that. But um, like I said, keep your prices low to keep people coming back to you until you have something of value, until you get a single, until you get a bigger record where you can charge more. Okay. I just want to make sure I heard this clear. Uh-huh. If I have zero placements, I get an artist, they're loving my beats. Now it's time for a monetary transaction. Am I charging literally $50 to $100 to that beat? And if that's correct, and I heard that correct, explain to me the difference between exclusive and non-exclusive. Okay. Non-exclusive is they don't own the beat. Exclusive is they own it. So if they are leasing for non-exclusive and they're a brand new producer with nothing out, I would charge, you know, around 50 to 100 bucks. If you are a new producer with nothing out and you're over here charging somebody two, three, four grand, um, it's going to look kind of crazy because you have nothing out. And somebody will say, hey, well, I'll just go over there to YouTube and buy some beats for $20. I mean, dudes do this all the time. You know what I mean? So if you're trying to compete with with the other guys that are out here with no placements, keep your prices low until you get some value to your name, and then you can ask for more. But I'm specifically talking about leasing right now. So if it's going to be um, exclusive, you know, three, four, five hundred dollar $500 range until you get a big placement, then you can charge more. Okay, gotcha. If I'm a mid-tier producer, I uh-huh. have sold a couple of beats. Not a household name yet. Which of my rate beats? Okay, so now you're looking at, well, the standard rate right now, industry standard rate uh, for a new producer with no placements on a major label is between one to four grand. So let's say I placed a beat for Kevin Gates a few years ago. A producer never had any placements. They gave him $1,000. Okay, that's what they gave him. Seven to 10 years ago, I used to see dudes get seven to 10 grand, but because the game is so oversaturated and the budget shrunk, they don't have this big upfront to give new producers um, uh, for their beats. And I really feel like, you know, you have a streaming money tier and everything like that, and they should give producers more upfront, but they just, they don't right now. So a thousand dollars they gave him. And then let's say, boom, you get a Tory placement. Your fee might go up to like 4,500. And it's just going to keep building the more records that you have under your belt. So you just want to keep working, just developing those relationships until you can keep on stacking up those records. It's going to make your track be jump. Okay. You know, this is your area of expertise. Is it not common wisdom? If someone is in love with your beat, does it matter if I place beats before? It, you know, wouldn't they be willing to spend more for a beat, even if I've never placed one beat or I've never had a single? Or does it not work like that? I mean, over the years with the internet kicking in and all these free software programs and people are bootlegging Pro Tools and things like that, it has made the track value just diminish. And I feel like even though you think your tracks are so great, and you've never sold anything, but then you have somebody come and they love your beat and they're in love with it and they want to keep it and they want it exclusive. Some guys, and you can ask a ton of producers, they just don't want to pay for the beat. They don't want to pay a bunch for the beat. Like they're like, oh, I'll just give it to you on the back end or oh, you'll get your percentages and points on the back end. But a lot of people don't want to pay that upfront fee, you know? You know, before we move the interview forward, is there Uh money in the game for producers. I know I know we're focused heavily on entry level producers the mid tier, but the game is making money again. This is not like 
2005 through maybe 2015. When, right. You know, the, the well had dried up. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money back in the music industry. There is, yeah. You know, do you ever get to a point where you can make real money as a beat producer? You can. I mean, there's tons of way to get money in this game as a producer or an artist, but it depends, like, what are your outlets? What are your networking skills? What is your network like? Um, you know, are you tapped into music supervisors where you're licensing your music, uh, background, television, uh, commercials, things like that? Um do you have a steady clientele base that purchases beats from you? Some people do. Some people have online beat stores like BeatStars or um, uh, Track Train, Airbit, any of these platforms where they have clients that come and lease a good amount of beats to kind of keep them afloat. You know what I mean? Like a lot of producers' bread and butter is the leasing game. You know, a lot of producers are making good money leasing. Um, but as far as like that long-term money, um, that's going to come from publishing. And that's why it's so important that if you're a producer and you're looking at like longevity in this game is really to get records out here so that you can just keep your publishing going, you know, and that's really where a lot of the money is going to come from. Okay. So let's talk other revenue streams. If I'm a music producer, talk mm -hmm. to me about points. If I'm an entry or mid-level producer, what, what type of points am I looking at? You're looking at between one to three points of standard. So when they create the, you know, the producer deck and agreement and things like that, it's going to be in there. It's going to be in there for you to, to sign off on. So is this the same, is this the same for entry level and mid tier? Or is that, that one point geared toward entry level, the three uh -huh. points geared toward mid tier? Yes, yes, yes. It's going to be based off of your discography. Everything is a stepping stone in this business, like you know, and so you just got to keep on working, keep developing yourself, and, and just keep on trying to get placements to get your um, get your discography up. Understood. Let's stay on the lines of the different revenue streams. What type of advance is an entry-level or mid-tier producer looking at? You're looking at between the one to four grand range. Um, like I said, if you have nothing out, they're going to look at your discography, publishers, and, and, and these teams, they look at um, your credits. So they're going to be able to see, you know, what you have out here. If you have nothing placed, it's going to be in the $1,000 range. I, I, like I guess I I'm asking, I, I guess I'm, maybe I didn't frame the question accurately. Again, and I apologize because this is your area. When I'm thinking mm -hmm. of in advance, are they giving me, let's say I sign off on a beat for $1,000. Am uh -huh. I getting $4,000 front? Am I getting 50% and then there's 50% on the back end? How am I getting paid? No, you'll get the whole up front. Like, let's say you place a Tory record and you get four grand up front. You're going to get the whole thing up front and then you're going to get your back end, whatever comes in with the streams and the digital stuff. You're going to get your back end publishing. Okay, well, one, one thing before we move on. I, I know you're tapping the, the, the desk and I'm hearing the sound feedback as you're doing. So um, please insert okay. your hands. Uh, okay, so I would get all, if you sign off on a $1,000 beat, I'm going to get that money right out the gate. I don't have to worry about the back end. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're going to get that up front. How does royalties work? How does publishing work? Yeah, so publishing works, um, you know, uh, they collect all the streaming stuff, the digital stuff, the overseas radio, satellite, all those things combined, and unit sales, and you're going to get your just due to your publishing checks from all that whenever they collect everything. Okay, we all hear the horror stories about people saying, I've only got my advance, I only got my front end money. I have never, ever seen a publishing check. This is something that is far too commonly heard in the music industry. Is it as simple as going to your mailbox every three to four months and there's going to be a check there? Why, why, why do we even hear that argument? And what can people do, producers who are getting in the game, what can they do to ensure that their publishing is intact? Okay, that's a good question. I get that question a lot too. Um, a lot of times, 
um, when you're dealing with the publishing and the split sheets and, and things like that, which is really important to sign, um, you're not getting the other party's information. So let's say uh, Jeezy reaches out to the producer and says, hey, bro, send me over the files and your BMI number. And the producer sends over the files and his BMI number. And let's just say uh, the major artist goes and registers the whole thing in his name and doesn't get the producer's information. Do you think that that stuff is going to be registered for the producer? No, because they're looking out for themselves. So that's why when you know that it's going to be a placement, you have to do those splits so that they have your information, you have their information, and when you log into your BMI or ASCAP account, that everything is there because it's going to have everybody's names and their IPI number and all that stuff. So it's really important to get both parties' information. So if an artist does hit you, and let's say it's not going through me, and they hit you direct, and maybe you're starstruck, oh, this is him hitting me, I'm going to send him everything he wants. No, because it's going to be hard for you to get paid on the back end if they don't have your information and you don't have theirs. You're not going to find, you know, Jeezy's uh, ASCAP number floating around online. You'll find his government name, but not his ASCAP stuff. And that's why it's really important to do the proper paperwork when you're filling out these records. And that is why producers don't get their uh, back end money a lot of times is because it's all fucking unorganized, you know? Understood. Talk to me. You, you just brought up split sheets. Mm -hmm. I'm a novice. What is a split sheet? Where do I get it from? Who supplies it to me? How do I make sure it's filled out properly? Talk to me in depth about these split sheets. Yeah, the splits are a percentage is broken down of who did what on the record. So it's the producer share, it's the artist share. The artist share is always 50%. The producer share is always 50%. Um, your government name, your production name, uh, any sample information, the name of the beat, the name of the song. Uh, you know, my ASCAP number is their ASCAP number. Everybody signs off on it. Everybody gets a copy. I always make my own split sheets. You know what I mean? I've been doing this for a while, so I know what goes on there. There's templates online. Also, the label sends the splits over for you to fill out and sign, too. So it can happen a few different ways. But if you have your own template um, on your laptop, you'll be prepared. So when you do need to fill out splits, and it's going to be a secure placement that you have that information. Okay, you're seasoned. You've been doing this for years. So, of course, you may have your own. You also said that there's some online. But say, you know, just for lack of a better example, you were speaking about Jeezy. Jeezy reaches out to me. I'm a new producer. I'm starstruck. I uh -huh. send my stuff over to him. How do I ensure, like, at, at that point, should I get a lawyer in? Should I go online and download this split sheet and send it over to should I send it over to them before I send the beats to them? Like, what is the process coming from my standpoint as a new or mid-tier producer? Yes, if you feel uncomfortable that you need to get a lawyer, yes, you should get a lawyer, definitely. Or if you have a manager at that point, they can help you with that administrative stuff. And that's where I kind of come in when I'm placing beats and brokering things is I help out with the administrative side because I know that it's new for producers and I like to help them out with the paperwork. But um, um, you, um, you do need, um, somebody that knows what they're doing if you don't know what you're doing and to just kind of help you properly register everything when it's coming from the label. Um, a lot of times they'll send the splits over with the producer agreement and the producer deck and you'll be able to look at everything if you need a lawyer still and look at everything and sign off on it and turn it in. Um, but I wouldn't send over files with no paperwork or files with no check. You know what I mean? Like you want to hold on to those files. Okay. You mentioned ASCAP and BMI. Uh -huh. Again, there are a lot of producers out there. They have not placed anything yet. They may have heard of these organizations, but they don't know what these organizations do. Explain to us what these organizations do. And once I fill out the split sheet, how do I make sure that it's properly registered with any of those um, organizations you mentioned? Okay, um, with the splits, you either turn that into the label and then they um, take care of that end. But then also you register your own stuff. You log into your ASCAP and BMI account and you register your own work. Stop, stop now, there for one second. 
and, and again, I want to go slow because you know this. Somebody in the audience might not. How do I even get an ASCAP or BMI account? Do I need to be represented by both or just one? Really slow walk us through this process. Okay. So ASCAP and BMI um, are PROs, which stands for Performance Rights Organization. And then they also have CSAC, that's another one. And then they have SOCAN, if you live in Canada, that's the one that you would sign up with. Um, they're all really good. No one is better than the other one. They're all professional. All major producers and artists are signed up with either one of those. I'm with BMI, I really like BMI. Um, and, and you sign up, um, you pay your 150, and then you will get like five different names you know, like Sarah J Music, Sarah J Music One, whichever one is available out of those five choices, um, that will be your publishing name. And then, you know, when you look on credits and things like that, you will see that appear and that's your publishing name. And it will also come with the IPI number, which is attached to your account, you know. Um, you register your own works though. Like you, you know, you log into your account and anytime you get a placement, you register it. Now, the thing that I see a lot happen with producers is they tell me, oh, yeah, I just registered my, um, my beats with BMI. Registering your beats is different from registering song placements. When it's an actual full song placement, it goes to your BMI, your ASCAP, or your CSAC. If you're talking about registering beats, you're actually talking about copywriting beats through copyright.gov. So that's different. So a lot of producers, they get that confused. They think that they need to copyright their beats through their performance rights organization. And when it becomes a full placement is when you do that. Okay, so you said you were registered with BMI. Go uh -huh. on to my earlier question. If you're registered with one organization, do you need to be registered with any of the others? Or does BMI handle collecting all of your royalties? Yes, you only need to choose one. Yep, just choose one. Okay. Now, Prez Beats, I'm finally on the verge of selling my first beat. I have okay. somebody who's willing to pay. I'm ecstatic. I'm now registered to BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and I forget the other one you said. So can. So can. I send uh -huh. my split sheet over. It, this is if I'm working for... Uh, um, and handling my business over myself. I can okay. go to the internet, download a split sheet, send it over to the artist or his representative or her representative. Once they fill out their side and we can both agree on these terms, whose responsibility is it to send this information to either BMI, ASCAP, or the others? yourself you're you're responsible for yourself so the major artist is going to register his own works with his team and the producer is going to register their own works with themselves if you are signed to an administration deal or a publishing deal they're going to register their works for you and i'm signed with an administrative deal i love it and one of the things i like about it is i don't have to register my own works and i know that it's getting properly entered in the system really well and collected on. And that's why I signed to an administration deal. And I really um, encourage new producers to sign administration deal too. Okay, administration, administration deal, what is that? Administration deals is, there's no big money up front, but they do a great job collecting for you on the back end. So they scour the net, they scour overseas, satellite radio, stream, YouTube, anything uh, where your records are placed. They were able to collect for me on really old stuff, Dipset and Nipsey and all mixtape stuff that sometimes I feel like your BMI can't catch. So um, it just makes sense. It makes sense for a new producer to sign one because let's say you have no value to your catalog. If you sign an administration deal, you're going to build your value to your catalog because they're going to help you collect on everything. So then if you want to get a publishing deal, you have more work to your catalog versus having nothing out and, and nobody wants to give you a pub deal. How is this different from what BMI is supposed to do? Administration deal? Yep. Um, it's almost like 
a temp agency where they're really doing the work, you know, they're, they're finding where these records are being played. You're not having to, uh, you know, but wouldn't that, up on wouldn't that be the responsibility of BMI or ASCAP? No, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't like go and, and go find old mixtape records and, and, and scour like these administration companies do. They don't, they don't only for major placements. What type of percentage are you giving up to these administration um, administration companies, and also to BMI, ASCAP, and the others? It's a eighty twenty split. Producer eighty twenty uh, percent administration companies. To me, it's fair. It's very fair. And publishing deals to me don't make sense for the average producer unless you're like a mustard or a murder beats or somebody that has huge records on the radio. Uh, you know, you see a lot of uh, people, on, a lot of major producers on Twitter talk shit about, I hate my pub deal. I can't wait till I get out of it. I'm not going to name names. Uh, I can't wait till I get out of this deal. I hate it. And a lot of the times why these bigger producers complain about their deals is because they're given this big 200 grand up front. And let's say they're promised they're going to work with Justin Bieber and Nicki Minaj and all these people. It doesn't happen all the time. You don't recoup and you end up owing that money back, you know, and it really sucks. And you know, to have that amount of money over your head that you owe back and maybe you can't turn in all the records to recoup, um, it just doesn't make sense, you know, for the average producer. So that's why I really like the administration deal is because you don't owe all this money, but they really help you collect on your stuff that you already have out. Okay, so it's an 80-20 split. Uh -huh. If I'm a new producer, mid-tier producer, do you recommend, if I'm not placing a lot of beats, handling the business on my own, or should I go out there and get a, a, a lawyer to handle my business for me? I've always said that if you don't have a lot going on and you're just starting out, I would try to learn the game on your own and do as much research as possible and network as much as possible and build your own relationships so that, number one, you don't have all these hands in your pot. And number two, you're kind of learning the game like you should so that you don't get taken advantage of, you know? And I feel like a lot of people take the easy way out and they, you know, want to get a lawyer right away or they want to get a manager, but they have nothing going on. Like if your phone isn't ringing all the time and you have no placements and you have nothing out, like I don't think it really makes sense for you to get a manager right away. Okay. Just, just say now my phone is ringing for the first time. Uh-huh. Jeezy wants my beat. Should I try to navigate my way through that exchange myself? Even though it's my first placement, I'm not making a ton of money. Or should I say, look, I want to make sure my that it's done right. Let me go ahead and get a lawyer. Yeah, at that time, if it's a major artist like that and you don't feel comfortable and you have no experience, yes, I would get a lawyer and 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 just help that uh, you know through the through the process of, of all the paperwork and everything else, if it makes you feel more comfortable, yes, I would. Talk to me about negotiating. You gave us kind of a range on what new and mid-tier producers should expect to make per beat placement. Uh -huh. Is there any room for negotiation? I know you said typically you will ask up front, hey, what's your budget look like? But if I'm a person who's never sold my beat, I don't have Sarah working on my behalf, do I even have room to negotiate? Should I try to negotiate or should I just be worried like, damn, if I put up any kind of argument or back and forth, they're just going to go and get a beat from someone else? That's a good question. And a lot of times that does happen. If you are hard to work with, you have an attitude of ego, things like that. I've had labels say, hey, Sarah, I love his beats, but I, I can't mess with his personality. Please don't send me anything else from him because of his attitude and ego. If you are a new producer and you're flexible and you're willing to um, you know, work with the label and just be realistic about um, your background and uh, you know, your, your discography, um, I would uh, just kind of go with what the going rate is. Um, I mean, you can always negotiate with people if it's like, 
maybe not on a label and it's like an independent artist and they're like, Hey, I'll give you $200 for the beat. And maybe be like, Oh no, I'm sorry. I don't go lower than five or, you know, things like that. But when you're dealing with uh, a major label, a lot of times these guys have budgets, certain amount of money they can spend on beats. So if they're offering you, you know, two grand and you're saying, no, oh, that's that. I- I'm only going to take 10 grand. Like they are going to go with another producer. I've seen it happen. Tons of times. So that yeah. definitely happens. Yeah, it does happen. Yeah. So you would recommend them, one, remain a pleasant personality, but mm-hmm. understand that there is not very much open negotiation up until mm-hmm. you wait up. Yes, yes, exactly. Now, um, I have found through my experience that negotiating um, for multiple producers on their behalf, if it's like a collaboration between like two and three producers on one beat, I'm able to get them a little bit more because there's more people involved on the record but if it's one producer and like you're talking about it's your first placement um you got to be pretty flexible i would get my foot in the door and just get that first placement and just keep on you know racking up the placements okay talk to me about a song trust what is it and how does it work okay yeah song trust um is a digital platform where they help collect royalties same with royalty network um there's lots of companies out here that help producers uh collect their you know digital sales and things like that and um i mean if you're interested in that you can find those kind of deals too got you and t- just stick on the, the, the area of additional revenues because it doesn't sound like you know, as an entry level producer, you got to really do this for the love. You're not going to make a ton of money out the gate. Yeah. In terms of Spotify, uh, iTunes, all of the streaming platforms. Uh huh. Is this the administrative agencies that would collect from them? Is it the BMIs of the world that would collect from them, or is it your responsibility to watch? and make sure that you are being paid for every stream that that, um, comes in? Well, calculating streams is very hard to do. I've done it with my other A&R friends. We've tried to look at how you do it and things like that. It's almost impossible. So, um, and I think they make it like that for a reason. I I definitely do. But um, if you're assigned to an administration deal um, and you're registered with BMI or ASCAP, so can, or CSAC, uh, that is your job and you will get your, you know, just do, uh, in your account from the streams that your records generated. Got you. I want to go backwards for a second. We briefly touched on beat licensing versus sales. Okay. What are the advantages of either? If I'm a new or mid tier producer, do I strictly want to license my beat? Is there more money in that? Or is it better for me to just say, look, I can get a higher upfront rate by selling my beat Mm -hmm. the way I can eat? Like, what do you recommend for newer producers? I feel like the leasing game is the quick money. And sometimes a lot of guys at least don't have a lot of patience and they just kind of want to get their beats off quickly Um, versus holding on to them and being more exclusive for industry placements. It's, a little bit more of a waiting game and I always encourage producers that if you are leasing and you're shopping for major industry placements to myself and other A&Rs and things like that to make sure that you have separate batches of beats so that if uh, you know you lease this beat out to this guy over here on your you know on your network and then and then you sent it to me and then TI gets on the beat and then he wants it for his album, but then you leased it to this independent guy. Sometimes these guys get in their feelings about, um, you know, about the beat and being attached to the beat. So make sure that you're separating batches of industry placement beat and, and leasing beat so that those don't get confused. Cause then the major artist isn't going to want the beat after a while. If he finds out that it's a lease beat. Gotcha. What if I'm working with independent artists? You know, we've all heard these stories about Little Nas X, um, designer. You know, they tell these tales that, oh, I bought my beat for $250. Are right, those yeah. that were leased to them? Or 
were those beats that were sold to them exclusively and should producers always kind of err on the side of caution like look you know any record it doesn't matter if the artist is established or not it can potentially become a mega hit so uh -huh. What, you know, in terms of, of these newer producers, would you say, look, kind of stick to, to the leasing side? I would say uh, usually when these major artists grab beats from the internet, they might be in a studio late one night and they just go on YouTube and find a beat and start rapping on it and record to it. They might not even contact that producer and they might just put the record out and the producer has to reach out to them and their people and the label and say, hey, that's my beat. And, you know, he didn't hit me up about the paperwork or give me any money for it. And that happens a lot. You know, that happened to the designer beat. I mean, it happens a lot in this industry because beats are so available and ready everywhere that, like, a lot of times the business doesn't get handled properly, you know, just because people are unprofessional or you know, they don't think to hit up the producer or, you know, lots of things like that. But, um, yeah, the, the whole leasing game is just, um, it's a big argument in the producer community because you have a lot of guys that like to lease and then you have a lot of guys that are opposed to it that just don't do any leasing. Gotcha. So it's kind of, it depends on the individual. Yeah, yeah. You are a manager. When should a producer take on a manager? When is the right time? The right time is when you have so much work and, and you're, like I said, your phone is ringing and you just have so many deadlines and maybe a couple major artists interested in your beats. Um, and you have some placements out. That's when you really need a manager. Um, until then, I would just keep on developing yourself, shopping, you know, your beats around, uh, attending different networking events, um, and just really getting yourself out there so that you can kind of brand yourself so that you don't need a manager right away. So as a manager, are you selective with the producers that you take on? Is there a requirement where you're like, okay, you have to be a working producer for me to even represent you? What, are your, what is your, the, the criteria that you look for in a producer before you represent them? A good question. Over the years, uh, I've managed several producers. I tell producers all the time because I get this question every day in my inbox. Hey, Sarah, can you manage me? You know, I don't like to manage people um, until I get consistent placements with you. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. I don't want to, you know, like have 50 guys signed and only four of you are uh, placing records, you know. So I like to be fair. I like to um, get music in from all my social media platforms from my other A&R colleagues. I have other artists that send me their producers. I like to listen and keep my ear to the streets all the time. But as far as locking in and doing management paperwork, I like to wait until I get some work with you. Understood. Is there a difference between a quote unquote beat maker and a producer? Yeah, I would say that would come with just your, um, your experience and your history and um, kind of your level of professionalism too. I mean, a lot of beat makers, um, they don't take time to develop themselves right away. They might just be entry level starting out. Um, and maybe some of their sounds are not up to par. Maybe they don't know how to run a studio session, things like that. And that's what I feel like separates a beat maker from a producer. A producer can actually go into a session if Atlantic Records called them and they can run a SSL board and they can help somebody with their vocals and mixing and um, just like an all over around, you know, producer uh, versus beat maker, which is more entry level. Okay, so you, you, when you think of a beat maker, that's very entry level to you. Um, depending on how many years, like, when I have uh, beat reviews and things like that, I always say, how many years have you been producing? Oh, only six months. Oh, eight years. Oh, two years. You know, and so I can kind of tell by just their background, um, you know, and their passion and things like that um, of, of kind of what level they're on, you know. And you can kind of hear it in the music, too. You can hear it in the music. 
Got you. Can you talk to me about these beat stores? Are they worth it for producers? What are some of the prominent beat stores out there? Mm -hmm. um, I used to be with PMP Worldwide, as you know, um, and that was a major uh, producer marketplace where you would put your beats up online, kind of like your own shop, and put your contact information up there. You put your bio, you know, um, some of your beats up there, and you can kind of just wheel and deal online. I think it's really smart. I think if you're a new producer right now, you need to be on every platform, you know, like the Beat Stars, uh, Track Train, Airbit, um, Audio Mac, uh, SoundCloud. You need to use your Instagram, your Twitter, use all platforms. And um, I think you can make some money and I think you can make some good connections too. There's a lot of major um, A&Rs and artists that check uh, producers' music out on Beat Stars and YouTube and things like that and actually contact them. You know, just because you feel like nobody's watching you or hitting you up, there's people out here doing their research on you and, and watching your pages and listening to music that you might not know. So that's why I always tell producers, like, make sure you're refreshing your beats on your beat stars or your SoundCloud. Keep it fresh. So if you have repeat clients coming every week to check you out, you don't have the same stuff up there for like a year at a time, you know. You know, that's interesting because it's, if your phone's not ringing, no one's hitting you on a DM asking for your music. It's right. to think that I am a, a, a raindrop in the Pacific Ocean. No right. Yeah. My music. Are you yeah. saying that there are, you know, just because your phone's not ringing, you can't assume that people are not coming across your beats? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people, I tell producers all the time, like, okay, let's say we're just talk about a beat battle or uh, a music showcase and music conference. No, nah, I don't want to go to that. I never win. I think it's rigged. I'm not going to meet anybody there. And I'm like, no, like we have A&Rs, you know this, Chris, like A&Rs that go to these events, they might not tell you that they work at Rock Nation or wherever, but they're there looking for artists and producers. They're there just kind of checking out the scene. They're not going to let you know that they're checking you out. But that's why you always have to be prepared. You know, you always have to have flash drives with you with your beats loaded up on them. Like, you never know who you're going to meet. You just don't know. And if you go with that mindset of, oh, I'm never going to, and I'm never this, and I'm never going to meet, and I'm never going to win, it's not always about winning the beat battle or the showcase that you go to. It's about who's going to be there. You might bump into somebody's assistant or somebody's engineer or DJ or somebody that, sees you and wants to mess with your music and, and develop that relationship. So it does make sense. Okay. You mentioned a and mm -hmm. In today's marketplace, what is the best way for me to shop beats? Or is it no best ways? It's just anything and everything. Because back in the days, the only way to really get a beat place was to get it to an A&R. Mm-hmm. Is it necessary to go that direction now, or is it just a wild, wild west out here? Get your beats exposed as best as humanly possible. Right, right. You know, I always tell producers there's no one way into this business, so I would hit from all angles, and that's what I do, and that's what I've been doing over the years. I send stuff to the engineer. I send stuff to the DJ attached artist. I send stuff to the A&R. I send stuff to the road manager because – these are people that are all going to be in the room when they're recording vocals and things like that. And if you're just trying to shop to one person, it's going to be like you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And over the years, just knowing different people in their camps and how they work, if I know in my mind, maybe I say, oh, Ross is whatever, uh, engineer, maybe, okay, uh, maybe he doesn't listen to beats. When I find that out, when I know that, when I know from building a relationship that, okay, he's not really a beat dude, I'll go to somebody else in the camp that I know is actually running through beats. And that's what you kind of have to do is figure out who's the person that's really listening to these beats, who you think can place these records and kind of get to that person. So you don't have to do so much middleman stuff. Gotcha. You know? mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's a common theme amongst everything that you're seeing, all the great advice that you're giving. Does it still just come down to networking doing whatever you can to get yourself in front of the right people. Would uh -huh. you say that networking still today in today's market? Because everybody is sitting behind their computer. They just think I, should, I can throw something up on social and 
Right. You know, my life's going to change. What's the importance to you as a person who does this for a living and has been extremely successful at it? I know you started your career out networking. Mm -hmm. But in today's market, how important is that? Very important. I mean, if you're doing the same thing that every other producer is doing out here, spamming links, and hey, Wale, did you listen to my beat? And hey, Meek, did you check out my Beat Stars page? You're wasting your time. Um, nobody looks at links. Nobody clicks on those. They think it's a virus. We all think it's viruses. So we're not going to click on random links. The best thing that I feel like you can do and what I tell producers all the time is to start booking major uh, studio sessions at these studios in LA, New York, Miami, and Atlanta. And this is where you're gonna bump into people. You can't wait outside with your CD, that's old school. You know what I mean? We used to wait outside, Def Jam with your CD and shit. But book your own session so you have control of your own room so that nobody's kicking you out and it's your session. And maybe you wanna have a listening session, you invite some artists through, some A&Rs through, some other writers. Um, but then you control your own, you know, session because you paid for the time. So that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Got you. What's mm -hmm. the best way to protect yourself? You know, when you're a no-name producer, anybody could take your beat and just recreate it. Or let's just say uh, an established artist, like you said earlier in the conversation, jumps on your beat. They don't contact you. You can call up and say, hey, look, that was my beat. Like, what is the best way for an upstart to protect themselves? I would definitely copyright my beats through copyright.gov. That's C-O-P-Y-R-I-T-E dot gov. And uh, you used to mail in um, like a CD of beats of like 18 to 20 beats. And I think it used to be $30. Now you can do everything online. So if you copyright your beats, you know, everything that you're sending out, you know, for professional placements or whatever, it really makes sense because then your music sits in a vault. And if anybody, you know, claims that, hey, I made that beat, you actually have evidence and proof that you copyrighted your beats. If you don't have that, it's going to be kind of hard. I mean, sometimes you can show your, uh, your masters or whatever. You can do that sometimes. But I think it just makes sense to copyright a big batch of beats uh, that you feel like are, you know, the ones that, that are going to get major placements so that they're copyrighting. What's the cost of copyrighting a beat? Well, it used to be $30 for like 18 to 20. Um, I have to go and look what it currently is. It's probably a little bit more now. It might be like 30 or 40 bucks, but everything's online. You don't have to mail in CDs anymore. So if you just go to copyright.gov, you can check it out and you can start, you know, today copyrighting your beat. Gotcha. Let's say I create an incredible beat. Some artist wants to pick it up, but it contains a sample. Who's responsible for clearing that sample? Uh, the label. The label. Um, a lot of producers think that they have to clear the sample, and you don't. I work a lot with uh, clearing samples. A lot of the samples that we have to clear from records uh, happen to be like a random singer from SoundCloud that we have to contact. Um, and they're usually pretty cool about stuff, but I always tell producers, like, you don't want to sample Sade or Michael Jackson or the OJs, you know, things, you know, you know the OGs of the game. It's going to be really hard. You know, people like Luke and, and older vets, they're waiting for producers to uh, use their music so that they can get a piece of your pub or whatever, which is cool, but they're going to take a big percentage off of the sample. And that's why you have companies like Splice, where you can um, get royalty-free samples. A lot of producers mess with that website. And there's just a lot of producers smartening up about what samples they're using because they don't want to pay that big fee. It can take, like I said, a big percentage of the record, and then your whole placement is, is uh, going to be you know, less on the money side than percentages because of that big sample clearance. Got you. You know, once upon a time, producers could only eat selling their beats to artists. Uh -huh. Now, everybody is into film. There's a whole television market. People are making documentaries. What uh -huh. is the process of submitting your beats to film companies and 
is it the same rate? Am I still looking, you know, if somebody has a documentary and they found my beat online and they wouldn't, uh -huh. am I selling it for the same $50 to a hundred dollars as I would to an artist or can I charge more? Yeah, there's more money in the licensing game. It's just a very tedious game. Is a lot of in-house, like let's say LA producers that they grab music from. Um, this is where you're really going to have to develop your relationships and know a lot of music supervisors. And I always encourage producers that whenever there's an ASCAP or BMI Expo, that you go to those. A lot of them are hosted in LA, Nashville, and New York. And this is where you're going to bump into all the publishers and the um, music supervisors. And it's really important to try to get to know them if you're trying to get your beats, you know, for sync licensing opportunities. Okay. Say, say I'm lucky enough to get my beat noticed and they want to license it. Do you have any idea of what my event should look like, what I should be asking you know, if, if, if a documentary wants to use my beat or uh, uh, a television show wants to use my beat? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more higher, 8, 10, 12 grand range. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's going to be more money up front for that, yes. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, it is. You you spoke about this earlier, but I didn't want to I, I didn't want to dive deep into it because, at, you know, we were focusing on entry level or the mid-tier uh, producers but uh -huh. say myself Sean Beats, Prez Beats I'm starting to pop you mentioned production deals uh -huh. explain as best you can what is a production deal and when should somebody consider taking a production deal okay production deals were really big back in the early uh, 2000s, you know, they were called P&D deals for producers. But since the internet kicked in and it's an oversaturated market for producers, they do less of those. Now, guys that are offered production deals in this day and age would be more like the Mike Will, uh, DJ Mustard, more household names, Metro Bullman, um, guys that have, you know, a lot of placements that have huge discography, singles on the radio, some of them turned into DJs. Um, and those are the guys that are getting production deals. They might even have like their company underneath an Interscope umbrella or, uh, you know, something like that. Like their company is able to get like a, a nice deal because they have so many proven, you know, hits on the radio that uh, they're going to get that kind of deal. But the average producer, you're not going to get a production deal right off the bat, no. So when we see these producers going online screaming about, I wish I never got into this production deal, uh -huh. more times than not, can we assume that they're more established producers yeah. that they're just not offered anymore? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Got you. You spoke about Mike Will, DJ Mustard, and some of the others, Metro Boomin. These guys are household names. Uh -huh. what recommendation would you give to producers to brand themselves branding comes from constantly seeing you know visuals seeing you out there so branding can come from your you know you're showing up to all the events all the showcases all the conferences all the south by southwest a3c festival just really making a name for yourself um also Utilizing the platforms like we spoke about, you know, BeatStars, YouTube, um, SoundCloud, um, big platforms where you can be, you know, putting your logo on there. Um, I always tell producers to get fresh photo shoots and things like that so that you can constantly, uh, you know, be reinventing yourself. Um, but it's going to come down to um, really your networking and um, appearing at all these events and showcases and things like that. So people are constantly bumping into you and know you in person. You know, we talked about everybody sitting at home in front of their laptops and throwing out their latest single on their Instagram and things like that. But people have to know you in person. Like the way you break bread with people and build relationships is also to see them in person. And I know a lot of producers say, oh, I work a nine to five or it's hard for me to travel, or how do I even get 
to the point where I would need an A&R for a meeting and things like that. And I, I get that question a lot, but it's just going to be from networking, you know, setting up meetings, trying to get as close as possible to these people that have access to projects that they're working on and budgets to, you know, spend money on with you. Okay, one th- one of the things that I noticed that all of the of the super producers that we mentioned earlier have in com- common is mm-hmm. they tag their music. You, you know, I can be listening to a record and that the the the, the intro it's Mike Will made it, or mm-hmm. you know if it's Sweets, I mean Swiss Beats, I'll hear something like Showtime. Right, you right. Really know it's their track. So yeah. Brandon, I know you went back to networking and getting yourself out there, but is mm-hmm. it recommended that producers brand their track or is this frowned upon, especially before you've really made a name for yourself? No, um, I believe in having a distinct tag at the beginning of your track. I think that's very marketable and I think it's a great thing to do. Um, so yes, I would have a, a nice professional tag at the beginning of your track. A lot of times what I see producers do and my other A&R colleagues, we laugh about it sometimes, is they'll put their tag running like every four bars, every four to six bars to the track. And it's a little bit too much. So then like, let's say the artist wants to record to it at three in the morning and he has their tag running all through it. So just put that one distinct tag, like you said, like Swiss does, and you should be good to go with just that one tag. Yeah, it's a great idea. How important is social media these days for producers getting themselves out there? Very important. Um, Producers need to market themselves just like artists these days. You know, it's like out of sight, out of mind. You want to be everywhere in the forefront. You want to be on every platform. I was reading Gary Vee's book called Crushing It recently, and he was talking about how if you're missing one platform, you're missing a whole clientele. And I have producers that tell me that they're not on TikTok or Facebook or certain platforms and I'm really surprised because a lot of these platforms are free. They're huge search engines, you know, for people to find you every day. And if you're not on these, it's like, I don't know how you expect a lot of people to find you, you know? So I would use all of them like we talked about and, um, and just make sure that you're really active, you know, just because you have a Twitter account and you don't tweet, you need to start tweeting. Like there's tons of people networking out. You just got to talk to people. You can't be afraid you know, like you're sweating somebody, you just gotta start talking to people and just networking. Understood. It keeps going back to networking. You know, when I got in the music industry, we it was drilled in our head. Relationships, right. relationships, relationships. Mm-hmm. Before we close out, is there a blueprint that any producer can follow to become successful? Or is it just a mix of all that you've spoken about throughout this interview? I would say it's a mixture and combination of everything that we spoke about, you know, just having a really good work ethic, just being consistent, um, being patient, uh, being realistic about like your goals, um, setting some goals, you know, Um, just utilizing every single day to make sure that you're reaching out to multiple people, that you're, being proactive about, uh, you know, making beats that you don't just make beats once a month and, you know, that you take time to travel and set up sessions and go to events and talk to people and follow up and, um, and, and don't be afraid, you know, to ask questions and to just mainly research, research everything there is about the production game, you know, publishing points, splits. Um, Got you. I remember when I was coming up in the game, it wasn't unusual for super producers to make $50,000 a track, $100,000 a track. At one point, Pharrell, they were making $150,000, $200,000 a track. Are those days coming back or are those days gone forever? Those days are gone because of the internet. Simple as that. Yeah, the days are gone of pain producers, big, huge upfront fees for tracks. I wish that producers would get at least, I wish a new producer would at least just get 15 grand a check. You know what I mean? Well, Uh, now now I'm talking super producers. You know, because I'm watching the industry change. We're seeing the artists 
they're being signed. Their deals are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. I'm in to have one record that's blowing up locally, and now a and is assigning you for seven-figure deals. Yeah. Has that not translated to the producer community? Because, you know, I can go back, and we can even go outside of hip-hop producers. Mm-hmm. I think of the Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis or the Baby yeah. Blues or the Teddy Riley's or uh, which Dark Child. These, it wasn't uncommon to make six figures for a beat. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I know. Um, I don't think that it has crossed over to the producer side yet. I think that maybe their rates will go up a little bit more um, as the years go on. But I feel like uh, the money is more into the artist's career because they can get their money back with shows and things like that. So with the production side, I don't think you're going to see like, you know, $100,000 tracks anymore. Um, But I do see more money coming back into the producer world, but not like we used to see it with those huge budgets. You remember those huge budgets. Yes, I do. Very well. Before we close out, if, if... A producer does go into an agreement with a manager. Uh huh. What is the standard percentage? Uh, the standard percentage for the uh, manager. For the manager, yep. Yes, twenty percent. Twenty percent. So that's fair. So if, if if a manager wants to take on a producer, uh-huh. a producer should not be like, oh, you know, you're trying to rob me, asking for twenty percent. No. And I see other managers uh, to this day taking 30, 40 crazy prices. And this is why as a producer, you need to know the standard rate is 20. Sometimes it's 15 um, because so that you don't get taken advantage because there are a lot of managers and people that will prey on people that don't know their business and take larger percentages. Sarah, you have been more than gracious with providing information I know that this interview is going to really help people and take a lot of the legwork out of it for them because you've been so open with all of the information that you've accumulated over the years. So I thank you on behalf of my audience. Where can my audience find you? Okay, great. First of all, Prez, thank you so much for reaching out to me to come interview me today. I really appreciate everything. I love helping out the producer community. You guys can find me on Instagram at sjmanager. Also, you can find me on Twitter, SJ Manager. Um, I just started an OnlyFans account, SJ Manager. It's all SJ Manager across the board. My email for Beats always changes. So if you look in the bio of my Twitter and my IG, it's always there. Got you. Again, thank you so much, Sarah. I would love to have you back in the future. Um, and, And just continue making power moves. You are a true power move maker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prez. I appreciate it. Take care. Peace. Peace. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.